Game on everybody! Division 7! Glorious Division 7! We are on Dragonshire and we have the Pushalors against 500 MS. We're gonna go over what Division 7 means in just a second in case you're not familiar with this, but let's introduce our two teams first. On the left side, we have the Pushalors with Falk on Oriel, Gorka on Kel'Thuzad, Sortilian on Johanna, Kata on uh, Reyna, Bobby Ryan on Arthurs, and on the right side of the map, 500 MS with Drog one Vala, the snazzy penguin on ETC, Emphethis on Anduin, another noob on Artanis, yep, fits, and Dark Cloud 9669, my friend, on White Mane, as we are heading into the first game of a best of three series in Division 7. So Division 7, as you guys might know already if you watched some of the games in the past, is the lowest division of HeroesLaunch.gg, an amateur league for Heroes of the Storm that exists in Europe and North America. If you've never heard of them, this is really the way that Heroes is supposed to be played, with like-minded players that are interested in a bit of competition. But Division 7, as I just mentioned, is the lowest division that they have, which means that most of the players here are on average between bronze and gold. That's usually the level of play that we're seeing here. It's also one of the most ridiculous divisions because there's just so much that's being done wrong here starting from drafting to individual decisions on the macro level within the game and also just simply micro mistakes. So usually when we have a game like this we can make quite a bit of fun of the playstyle here and it's sometimes really hilarious. Since there's always someone, at least on YouTube, that gets offended on the behalf of others, I have to throw the little caveat out that the players of Division 7 are very well aware of the fact that they might be casted, and most of them, actually all of them so far that I talk to, encourage that heavily, and normally send me even match links and replays and ask me if I can maybe cast their game, make a little bit of fun of them, so nobody is really getting offended here. The players enjoy it quite a lot, and especially when we're casting these games live, we usually have some of the players jumping into the Twitch chat, uh, the live chat immediately and also making fun of their own plays and having quite a good time with the chat there too. So in case that you're looking at this and you're like, oh, Kaldo, you are so mean to these players, they're trying their best, oh, that's so unprofessional. Yeah, stop being offended on someone else's behalf because uh, everybody involved is very well aware of what's going on and they encourage it highly. So yeah, with that said, we've already set the scene here for game number one. And yeah, I'm a little bit curious. I mean, we have a Kel'Thuzad, so first of all. Kel'Thuzad, generally speaking, when he completes his baseline, has a pretty big power spike, of course, with a 75% spell power increase that he's getting there. And yeah, this is one of these cool heroes that can make all the difference in the game, but you don't see him too much in high-level play for the simple reason that Kel'Thuzad pretty much can get dropped in the blink of an eye if there's any coordinated effort against him. We see him banned out even in Division 7 occasionally since, well, these coordinated efforts don't really take place that often on this level of play. But in this case we actually have 500 MS with a little bit more pressure thanks to the double shrine that they're currently holding against their opponent. Oriel is sitting in the middle and that's definitely not what you want. Oriel solo in the mid lane with nobody else. She has neither the wave clear nor the interrupt potential and the snazzy penguin gets interrupted. Did he actually cancel it himself? Like, I'm not even sure if Aureal had anything to do with that. Or if the shrine was taken beforehand. But as it stands, they are holding on to those shrines for now. Now, this is a situation that you normally want to avoid at all costs. Aureal alone just can't do jack shit. <laughs> She's just sitting there and saying, like, I'm helping! And the rest of the team is just saying, like, nah, you're not really, but yeah, we get it. So, you want to have someone with Aureal. Ideally, someone that can act as a battery, so that would, in this case, be most likely, well, Kalsazad or Jimmy, of course. And with Jimmy in play, we're actually having him now also with a pretty solid build so far. Here comes Arthur, as so he's starting to move in. So far, with no stacks on the level 4. We have a single kill in the game up to now. And at the bottom of the map, as we currently have that situation, we still see them hold on to the shrine as they lost the one up to the top. Quest on Vala, after the patch, he obviously came back into the game. And into the build. Ooh, Jimmy down. All right, Jimmy eliminated. Down here on the other hand, still the fight back. Up to the top, a little bit of a battle too. In the mid lane, we're having in the meantime Snazzy Penguin going up against uh, Sotillion. And the main battle is still raging on at the bottom of the map as we're having this 3 versus 2 setup in a desperate attempt to retake this shrine. Because ETC is threatening the middle. Johanna has interrupts available, so he shouldn't be able to get the uh, Dragonite on his own. 
But now that we have level 7 in play, we're also seeing the Echo Paddle. Johanna gets attacked too. Drag 1 in particular has now two additional talents. And that's a Dragonite, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. Dragonite is in. And with that, they have a chance to open up the game a little bit. And especially the map. In this case, focusing on the bot lane. Uh, 10 stacks now for Kalthuzad on the baseline. ETC in the Dragonite here. So uh, they're still relying on the rest of the team. The uh, uh, Tannis factor is actually something that I'm really curious in later because, I mean, Tannis is still a little bit of a noob trap. And uh, it's a hero that, if anything, you see him in Battlefield of Eternity because of amateur opponent. Seeing him on Dragonshire is more than a bit weird to me, to be absolutely honest. But right now, the team in red is not looking too bad. But let's see how uh, how Arthur deals with that at the top lane. Interestingly enough, Arthur still going into Rune Tap, which you normally only see with the IC talents on level four. It's more of an auto attack build style that you have with that. Normally, it's the Icebound Fortitude on level seven that is prioritized in the Arthur's build that we're seeing. Uh, the first dragon it hasn't gotten too much value. They have barely moved through the wall here. And granted, it's got changed a little bit. Ooh, that's a good connect and a little bit more damage done too. 15 stacks now for Kalthuzad, so that helps. But up to the top, another noob is still working with this. And uh, good old Bobby has a little bit of a problem connecting those Howling Blasts. I mean, we are right now five, six minutes into the game, and he's sitting on three stacks only. That's not something that you write uh, home to Mama about, because she's not going to be too proud of you if you list those down. And you probably have that overachieving brother that was already able to complete the quest within the first three minutes of the game And she's gonna compare him to you and you know then you're gonna get just mad and it just ruins your day You know how that goes, but also nice save here against Vala a level 10 ability sign And with this we have actually Reign of Vengeance grabbed by Vala immediately I could have even seen her go into strafe it's a cool talent to have if there is no... I mean, it's a really nice damage output talent that we see a lot from Grand Gaming's Tai and other players. If you don't have a Grey main or Genji or any hero that can really jump onto you, then Strafe is kind of nice if there's not too many interrupts on the other side. And there obviously will be a few, especially with a Blessed Shield on Johanna, but you can still play around that. Anduin with a Salvation, the Holy World. We're having a Suppression Pulse here. Still the pressure at the bottom of the map, and Kalthuzad is down! Our little Lich gets wrecked, and with this, we're now having him also with the Shadow Fisher. Ooh, and it's time for Syndragosa. All right, Syndragosa is getting played in this game. Yeah, that's actually a pretty cool one. And obviously, with Echo Paddle on level seven for ETC, we are also looking at him playing stage dive now, which is interesting considering that Artanis is the off laner. So ETC normally now wants to be on the off lane a little bit to get the additional value for them. So I'm slightly curious how they play this. If they actually shift Artanis into the main lane, because again, ETC wants to be on the side lane if you go into stage dive. There's actually very few teams that play stage dive if they have. Well, a main tank ETC. Granite does it occasionally, but it's not really the norm. Usually it's a switch that they have prepared for later on in the game. Yeah, also, a little bit of a push topside now. Bottom uh, cam got taken, and there's Syndragosa trying to push through already. Immediate ult from Artanis. And we have now at least the level 4 quest completed from Kalthuzad, but they're trying to break through the wall regardless. The problem is that it's a push against a push, and with two heroes to defend topside, and that additional bruiser cam taken at the bottom of the map, you can already imagine who's going to win that little encounter. 500 MS is pushing through pretty hard here. So, yeah, get that done. In the meantime, we're looking towards the damage output as the fort falls. I mean, this is a bad trade on all ends. So how would you actually make this trade a little bit better? The proper way to go about this is to go for the fort at the top, sacrifice your fort at the bottom, and before your opponent pushes into the keep, Hearthstone back and defend. So this was just a loss on every single uh, um, aspect for the blue team. It didn't help them at all. They weren't in time to defend the bot lane, and they didn't get anything out of that either. Get the kill against Vala though, so that's at least something. Vala a little bit too ambitious in that case. Especially against the Hyperion too. But yeah, if you find yourself in that position yourself, push the four down, accept that you're gonna lose the one at the bot lane first. Your opponent, if they know what they're doing, is gonna start pushing for the keep itself, and then you hearthstone back, defend the keep, and hold that. But you have at least traded evenly into the towers here, or into the fort. So that's actually really important. 
pretty bad talent on level 13 for Vala, not gonna lie. Tempered by Discipline might be interesting if you ever go into an auto attack build, which honestly you should never do outside of ARAMs. But this is not really the best talent to go for here. Usually we see Gloom taken on that part. Tempered by Discipline doesn't really give you as much if you go into that build here. In this case, a little bit of extra sustainability seems to be something that they are hoping to achieve. But yeah, not really the go-to. Neither Holy Fury with this, a little bit more AoE for them. And the aggression in the middle and ETC gets wrecked. Nice catch. 13 versus 14. Now it's about 10 minutes into the game. I gotta say, I mean, it's still fairly even. Now, there's a lot of choices, of course, that are being made that might not be ideal. We went over a few of those. Question that also just like overshadows everything here, like Damocles Sword, is when exactly will Kalthuzad reach his uh, baseline completion? Because once hand that he does pull that off, we are going to see him with a lot more damage that he currently has to his name. And Kalthuzad is sitting at 10,000. Not really comparable to Jimmy. But once he has the 75% spell power increase, he is going to really get some solid damage out. And that is obviously mainly burst if he connects everything, right? So that is going to help him a lot too. With that said though, we are still looking at a game that is not really that kill heavy yet. So in terms of talents, we have the triple strike on the side of Artanis. Uh, it's even an attempt to steal the camp away. Johanna is doing that pretty much solo. Someone should help her a little bit, but that also means that the tank isn't here. And Johanna is realizing that that was a pretty dumb idea and starts moving away from it, so doesn't accomplish anything here. And tries and help out the team, but the Hyperion has already been used to zone him out. With the double control on the shrines, it didn't do too much. But again, if you want to move into your opponent's camp, you gotta be a little bit quicker than that. You can't just simply send Johanna in here. With Conviction on level 4, there's an help either. Here comes the fight though, ETC <laughs> jumps straight onto the point. Immediate interrupt against Anduin, <laughs> and we're seeing the kill against Oriel. But that was an interesting one for sure. <laughs> ETC doesn't get a lot of value currently out of his ult. Again, if you go into stage dive, the normal idea behind it is that you can split off from the main group of your team, get side soak damage, and jump into the team fight to give your team a numeric advantage in the team fight itself. And he's currently not doing anything other than. If you're trying to play it a little bit differently, there's the howling blast. He doesn't even need it. <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh, at this point I'm not so sure anymore who has the 500 MS. It seems more that Artanis, uh, sorry, Arthur had a little bit of a brain lag by 500 MS here. That thing was definitely not needed anymore. Rain at this point probably just turns around and is like, dude, you serious? <laughs> that didn't do a whole lot. But yeah, why not? <laughs> The interesting part is that they could have probably at least pushed the fort a little bit if they would have just moved in afterwards, but they didn't. Now that we have level uh, 16 in, we're actually seeing the Seething Hatred. Again, not a great talent for this particular build. If you want to go for the talent, it's normally something that is played with an, uh, with an arrow build. Uh, there comes the fight though. ETC jumping to the back line. It's not connecting, but it's still there as a threat, of course. But they're getting zoned out again. But yeah, Seething Hatred is more so a talent you take with an arrow build if you go into into punishment. It's either Monk Decor if you have a good target on uh, the other side or you go into the Frost Shot. So not really a great talent that has been taken by Vala here. So definitely something to adjust if you play Vala yourself. Believe me, this is not really a build that you want to copy. So there are several elements of that build that just don't really come together here. Falk on Oriel though. He's down and so is Arthur's. So that's two kills for them, 16 versus 16. And still value found at the top side as they're pushing through with this one. Okay. And right now we're actually having the fort getting destroyed here quite quickly. And Artanis is trying to reclaim the top temple and see if they can maybe get the second Dragonite for themselves here. Still not completed, Gorka with the baseline quest and... <laughs> gets shit on in the mid lane. Ah, uh, too foul, don't know where your opponents are, gets jumped on and then there's a Dragon Knight afterwards immediately. So now we not only have a level advantage for 500 MS, but we also have them with a kill advantage of 2. With level 16 talents now in on both sides. That's... <laughs> Get wrecked! Anduin gets locked down and completely busted into the ground. Yep, so much for that. Uh, Kel'Thuzad just proving to be superior here. 
Uh, Rain of Vengeance is a little bit late to uh, do anything against Kel'Thuzad, but yep, he is back and he is ready to rock and roll. Especially now that his baseline is completed. Arthas is sitting at 134 stacks, he's soon going to be done with that. Gets actually thrown into this one, and Velk is apparently not interested in Vala. Okay, fair enough. So... <laughs> <laughs> the level of zero coordination here is amazing. <laughs> they still get the kill against White Man, but I love how Arthur's the entire time was just absolutely unimpressed by what was going on there. He first walks past Vala, doesn't care at all. Then he wants to go for Vala. It's like, ah, maybe not. Then he looks at White Man. The rest of the team is like, go, go, go. And Arthur's at no point just even reacts. There's no, there's no frozen tempest by him. There's no howling blast. They still get the kill, so it's fine. But it's actually pretty impressive. <laughs> ah, there's another punt. And they could maybe try and go for that. Nah, Jojo is going to be fine. Jojo's going to be fine. That was an early shield, jo Jojo might not be fine. <laughs> and the iron skin came out a little bit too early. But again. So second Dragonite has been taken. Can't really say that they got too much value. But they have two forts taken down. So again, they are ahead in structures. That's undeniable. We have level 19 against 18 and a half. We're currently sitting in a setup where, well, look at the damage actually. 51,000 for Vala. So despite the fact that the build doesn't really come together here, she still is the main damage dealer for the team. I mean, also the only range damage that they really have. They are pretty much currently rocking uh, that uh, the rest of the setup here, mainly with a Tannis trying to chip in a little bit. And that double support that they are running is so far working out for them. Here comes the kill against Reyna. And they get another one against Oriel as well. Cindergosa from the back. Arthur's running away though. That doesn't help them. Kel'Thuzan is at least trying to get a kill. But he's also getting murdered. And with the double support, the sustain is just there. And Vala just keeps on killing it. Uh, the harder she can go, the more aggressive she can be, the better for them. And Arthur's here again. They're dying for camp. Arthas drops a Syndragosa, but then at the same time he has this big problem where he just doesn't really feel the need to walk into the fight and tries to walk around it. And by the time that he's finally in any position where they can maybe pull something off, the rest of the team is already dead. Now, they get the camp at least, so it stops the, the uh, camps from coming in. And at the top they have a little bit of push value here too, but obviously that keep is down. And now there's an attempt for the core even. Uh, I guess, well, Jimmy is nearly there, so I don't really think they can finish the core off. But things are obviously not quite looking as good as they would hope for. So let's see what exactly is going to uh, be played out by them. There's still a little bit of a push at the bot lane. Arthas has currently dealt with this. Now they're not out of this yet. Red team still has a chance to win this, don't get me wrong. Uh, blue team, well, or less. Red team is obviously ahead, not only in kills and experience. They have a level 20. But also when it comes to pressure through the bot lane. But there's another Dragonite up for grabs, and that might be the moment where the blue team can turn it around. The pushalors need to push a little bit harder if they really want to get value here. Now Arthur is employing the fantastic wave clear that he has to uh, get that lane. The rest of the team is currently just rotating around and attempting to hold the middle. Okay. Uh, Jojo, don't use that blessed shield here. <laughs> Wait for the rest of the team. They need to kind of try and five men. I'm actually amazed that Kel'Thuzad is completely alone on the map at the top. This late in the game, you do not really want to have him without a... <laughs> they just get the dragon. <laughs> the stage dive into nowhere as the Dragonite gets taken. Guys, this is a five versus five with one team having storm talents and them just saying like, you know what, we don't want the Dragonite anyways. It's unfair if we get every single Dragonite in this game. We're going to give you one too. That's pretty much what just happened. And then <laughs> an ETC jumps in way too late. <laughs> they just gave the Dragon Knight up. Oh god. The fact alone that Gorka and Kel'Thuzad moved top lane alone and didn't get punished for it is amazing. And then they actually get the entire Dragon Knight because the red team is just sitting there. I mean, if they're British, then they probably had tea time going on or something. I don't know what exactly happened there, but holy hell, they just gave that up without even blinking. We have on 20 now the Radiating Faith. I, I really, really, really don't know what exactly you want to do with that. We see it occasionally, but we also have the absolute zero now. And well, there it comes, Hyperion, Kel'Thuzad, the Ultra Tannis, the bubble is in, where's the Interrupt? Interrupt is there, and they try and get some value out of that, chasing them already. 
Our buttons are being pressed and very little is accomplished. Artanis is still going for the cooldown reduction. Has pretty much an insta reset on it. But now at the top they have to also deal with this particular setup. But yeah, AO is fa fantastic. So now we saw the, <laughs> we saw the Syndragosa into nowhere and the stage dive into the zoning stage dive pretty much. Uh, <laughs> guys, I'm gonna stage dive in. They're never gonna see it coming. And I gotta admit, I never did. I never did see that one coming. <laughs> that one came out of nowhere. But yeah, 70,000 damage by Vala now. The double support is obviously meant to absolutely empower her. And if you play a double support Vala, then you also want to play it with ETC. So that's everything is alright in that sense. It's not really the double support that you normally have in mind when you're talking about Vala though. Oftentimes you're more so talking about shields on a hero like, let's say, well, Tassada that comes in with that. Who has additional wave clear. Because Anduin and White Mane, they are not really known for the wave clear uh, that they have here, the AoE damage. Here's a little bit of action going on in the middle. Keep that absolute zero in mind. Arthurs goes for ETC for just a second. Can't really do too much here. But it's time for Dragonite. And we are 20 minutes into the game. Division 7 so far is delivering. And the main question is obviously now who gets this one. Because it could be, might be, should be the last one of the game. Yeah, down here. Having them with another camp, so that at least works for them. But also at the bottom of the map, there's another one up for grabs. And this time it looks like we're going to see a j uh, Jack against the red team. Is that going to come in time? That should be an easy steal. They go in, they're trying to steal it. Where's the blessed shield when you need it? That bubble is there. Where is that? There it comes again. Arthurs from behind. And no ult has been used just yet, but they get the kill against Vala. They get the one against White Mane. ETC is on the run. Anduin has already fallen. The camp has been stolen. And ETC still trying to get out of here. That's not going to happen. Blessed Shield was used too. I don't know why. That was an insta kill either way. But with that, they are tailing four heroes. And there's already pings all over the place. Half the team wants to go for the bottom keep. The other half wants to go for the Dragonite. And they're deciding that they want to go both now. So this is exactly what's happening right now. Yeah, Tannis comes in again with a cooldown reduction. I mean, since he's hitting several heroes, he's already back to 20 to 5 seconds. But they're going to get the Dragonite for sure. And the rest of the team is already busying themselves at the bottom trying to open up the map. I don't know why they need three heroes to grab one shrine at the top and the Dragonite. I don't know why not two could have done that as well. But here we come again. They're trying to go for another noob, but the keep is low. And this is obviously the attempt to end the game here. This is the moment, and it couldn't be any more perfect for a Division 7 game. Where did they lose the game? Because they wanted to go for mercenary camp. Oh yeah, baby! Mercenary camps. What are you doing? Where are you going? Dude, you have absolute zero in Hyperion. It l what? <laughs> okay, it's like, screw the game, boys. There are still keeps here. <laughs> oh... <laughs> I'm already preparing my the game is over speech <laughs> And they're just looking at this and they're like there are still structures. We need to get maximum experience everybody Take down the keeps. We need all the keeps <laughs> And I mean granted they're gonna get this one. I hope so at least Yeah, yeah, yeah another breath of fire and they have it. <laughs> I can't believe that they just didn't end the game 22 minutes in with the setup that they have this should be an easy one for them but okay, so, uh, well, they're going up to the top lane. The Bridge of Death does not scare them at the slightest. They still have Hyperion. They obviously got their level 20s now, too. When you look at the damage output, by the way, we have still 46,000 on the side of Kel'Thuzad. 40,000 for Johanna. Because she has actually got a lot. But yeah. So here we are. Here comes the stage dive. Where's the absolute zero when you need it? Hyperion, come on! And there we go! <laughs> and they pop like pimples. Vala down, the double support is dead. Artanis is doing what he does best, dying. And we're seeing ETC on the run already. Oh god, please no. Just go for the core. <laughs> Oh, thank you. The rest of the team goes straight for the core. And they ping, they ping Bobby and they say like, dude, come on, like, now you're overdoing it. 
So yeah, they go for the core, try and get also the kill against ETC. You should never stack on the core like they do, by the way. That core does splash damage, so that's not really a smart idea. They're gonna win it anyways, but yeah, if you are actually attempting to kill the core, spread out and just start a step around it, or it's gonna do extra damage against you. ETC goes down, so does the core. The Pushalors with a victory in game number one here in Division 7 against 500 MS on Dragonshire. Game number two, everybody. The Pushalors are ahead here in Division 7 against 500 MS. They were a bit hesitant to really push for the core in the last game, but they finally did it. Didn't really have a lot of options left. We have uh, Fault now on Oriel in game number two. Gorka on Gul'dan, Kada on Reyna again, Sortilian on Ragnaros, and Bobby Ryan on Mirrodin. So a little bit of a switch between offlane and main tank. And 500 MS as they're trying to fight back into this with Drug War on Greymane, Snazzy Penguin on Diablo, Amphethys on uh, Rega, Dark Cloud on Sylvanas, and another noob on Rexa. And Drug War actually joined the chat after the last game and also talked a bit about his Vala build in the last game and said that they absolutely all agreed it was a pretty horrendous build to go for, but more of an experimental style where they tried to test something. And well, let's just say that test came out as we are not going to do this again. <laughs> that was pretty. Pretty much that. But yeah, still, with the double support setup that they had there, might not have been the traditional one, but for at least the mid-game, they had success with it. Now it's a more traditional style, single support from the red team, and let's see what they can pull off with that. In terms of uh, talents, we have Electric Charge taken for Rega, so a bit more value on the Shrine when the objective spawns. Obviously, there is currently also a Ragnaros up, up at the top. In Division 7, we've seen a couple of beautiful plays here. The Syndragosas, the stage dive. I mean, it's, it's a work of art sometimes. But let's see what game number two brings. And if we maybe even head into a third game between all of us. So, Greymane has made a comeback. If you watched any of the actual high-level plays that are usually put onto the channel then you know that by now too but yes Greymane is back to business for sure the auto attacks they hurt a little bit more the cursed bullet has been buffed by blizzard as well and therefore the wolf is back and they have actually the full wolf back in their setup i mean we're not it's a pretty beasty setup not only do we have the beastmaster with misha we have rega and also Greymane. so quite a bit here diablo on this map can obviously one shot later on in the game and Diablo is a fantastic tank, especially in Feral Shrines, he is insanely good. Now obviously you need to really practice your combos. That does not only mean your combo around the heroic ability, where you start with Apocalypse, you go into a devastating charge and then flip the target over into the stun circle. Standard combo for him. But also after level 16, you really want to try and get the double stun connected with a shadow charge after a flip. And that's really where Diablo can one-shot people completely. And that's something to watch out for if you're fighting on the shrine at any point here. So something to keep in mind for sure. But as it stands, we're now also seeing in addition to that, obviously the Oriel factor again, fight or flight here for Jimmy. And Oriel has already done a really decent job in the last game, not only on the heals, but also when we're looking at some of the stuns into the walls, it was pretty solid work too. Rexa with no animal husbandry, so not going into the memes. Instead with the hunter-gatherer embracing the extra armor that he's going to try and get later on. So this is actually going to work out. But, well, at the same time, we're still seeing the Sephora's hunger here, plus the catching fire. Ragnaros is always a bit of a weird pick. And traditionally doesn't really do all that much for you. On a big maps, you can have an impact. It's always the question, do you go into Lava Wave or do you actually go into Sulfurus? If you have stun sets up, set up, so you're trying to go for insta-kills and Sulfurus is the weapon of choice. If you are on a lower level and you're trying to play with Lava Wave, it normally means that you are attempting to get some macro advantage over your opponent by pushing with the Lava Wave the lane opposite to where the objective spawns. And that might be something that they're trying to embrace here. But either way, most of the time you will see different offlaners just because they give more value. And since this is also, I mean, again, this is a bit for fun, obviously we can make some jokes about some of the talents, some of the plays that are being made here, but let's not forget this is the amateur scene. This is actually the lowest level, which means we're looking at bronze to gold on average. 
But it's also really nice for a lot of people to learn by just looking at these mistakes and saying, okay, what do we have to avoid? And the one factor that I can't stress enough is how to actually play properly if you are on a lower level and you want to improve. And it's really just to focus on two to three heroes in your role and just try and perfect them instead of having too many heroes that you play where you think you can play two, uh, 10 heroes because I promise you one thing, if you are on that level of play, you don't. Focus on two and three heroes. Might be a little boring, but if your goal is to move up in the ranks, then they yeah, are. Focus on role, focus on a couple of heroes and play around that. Talking about playing those heroes, I mean, the red team has already taken a little bit of a beating in this. They have taken the advantage when it comes to the stacks, and I like that they move back to tap the fountain. I really like that a lot. So that shows that they have some coordination here. Not YOLOing into this single-handedly, but just tapping, straight going back in, trying to get the kill against Reyna. Jimmy is low, but the stacks are there for the blue team. They're abandoning it for a second. They should really focus on the objective now instead of getting the kill here. And they are losing the objective. What? The Pushalors with a massive fail. Instead of just simply sacrificing Jimmy and getting the objective, they tried to get the counter kill against Rhaegar, moved away with 37 stacks that they had. They lost a second hero and they lost the objective. At least they baited the Punisher over, but that was just a massive, massive loss for the team in blue. Big, big problem. You need to make sure that one of your teammates goes for it. And now Ragnaros is dead as well. That's three kills against zero. And all of a sudden, we are not only talking about a bit of a snowball scenario. This could be a potential avalanche that is going to hit them. Not really how you want to start into the first objective. They had a good opening at the beginning, but this was pretty brutal. So, yeah. Let's see what else we're going to get from this one out. I mean, all of a sudden, 500 MS is ahead. They played a really good mid-game, early game in the, on the first map, but this is just, yeah, just making this a little bit worse now. So, yeah, bad, bad move by the blue team, but let's see if they can maybe recover. We're having, in terms of talents, Meridian also going to the Sledgehammer. And I gotta be absolutely honest with you. If on level 4 you go into Sledgehammer, then it doesn't bode well for you if 6 minutes into the game you're on 7 stacks. That doesn't really look good for you. So he needs to work on this a little bit more and hope to uh, get the stacks together so that they get the completion on the quest. Uh, the baseline, that is. But yeah, here comes another jump. No Stormbolt, by the way. There was a perfect opportunity to get at least one more Stormbolt in, and he didn't get that either. So again, hit that Stormbolt and then jump out. When we're talking about stacks, Gul'dan is sitting at 28, and we're also having 8 stacks only on Sylvanas. She needs a little bit more on this too. Here comes the attack again, Muradin connects the Stormbolt, Apocalypse is in, and the blue team is trying to commit Sudoku here. They're jumping in, they're losing Gul'dan, they are losing Auriel, and they just started a fight against an opponent that is on level 10. This is pretty much the setup. If you are walking around on the streets, you're a little bit angry, and all of a sudden Colin McGregor is walking on the other side of the street, and you think like, hey, that's a guy that I can beat up. That's pretty much the same setup in which they went right now. They need to wait a little bit longer until they have level 10 themselves. Instead, they were just trying to sit down on the lane, trying to solve a Sudoku puzzle, and waiting for the opponent to completely wreck them. So uh, that didn't work out at all. Not what so fucking ever. Now they are still without level 10 and the red team is doing exactly what they should do. They push a little bit harder, but they might push a little bit too much. And they actually lose the doggy. Rega is down and ah, that was maybe a little bit too much. But bringing the wall down was definitely a good one here. So that helps. Up to the top, Dragvor is doing what a, what a great main player usually does. We have, by the way, the level 10s now. And with that, we also have them with the Sulfura Smash. Now, please don't tell Trixler, but I actually think that Lava Wave might have been the better choice here. Because with the setup that they're running right now and the limited amount of stuns that we're going to see here, I'm a little bit curious to see how much Sotillion is actually going to get out of the Sulfura Smash. Now, it might obviously be wrong. If he is a god and just connects every single one of them and they get insta-kills after maybe a Muradin Stormbolt setup, then that might work. But Muradin so far gives me the impression that he thinks he has only a limited amount of Stormbolts and that once he's out of Stormbolts, he has to reforge them and that's going to take some time. It's at least the only explanation that I have why he's not throwing out more of them. With that said, 
I don't think we're going to see a lot of stun setups. So maybe the macro play would have been the smarter one. Either way, we're having immediately Apocalypse. And that could be a kill. Kultan completing his quest and dropping the Horrify here. And the fight is a little bit chaotic to say the least. There's the Aegis as they're trying to save him. Drakwa is deep. Drakwa gets the kill against Oriel. Takes down Muradin. And at least Gul'dan survives. The rest of the team though is not looking so lucky. And the red team is now sitting in a decent spot on the shrine where they can start to get even more value with another objective. And let's not forget they have also a camp pushing topside. They have another one at the top side. Sylvanas by now on 14 stacks. <laughs> well, not really enough this late in the game. Muradin then again has not completed his baseline quest with Sledgehammer yet either. And they're still poking a little bit from the outside, but this seems to be like a pretty wasted effort. Honestly, I think Sylvanas could have jumped that way. Could have possibly gone in for that. <laughs> this is pretty much Gorka asking to get killed here. But the red team is a little bit lazy right now. They already got so many kills that they are just sitting there. This is like, oh, we got so many kills already. We don't need another one. Seven kills against one, 13 against 11 when we're talking about talent. So, an experience. Gorka. <laughs> Yeah, I told you, he was apparently tired of his life a little bit. Uh, I already said that when he was sitting in the middle of the lane. But now he moved a little bit farther out to give them another opportunity. He has twice the damage of the highest damage dealer of 500 MS. But again, if you can never really secure the kills, it doesn't really help you a whole lot. So that's a problem. With this now said, we're having, uh, again, 8 versus 1 kills, 2 level advantage. And the Sulfora Smash it actually connects with 2 at least but doesn't do anything else. And Jimmy is down. There comes a quick jump as we're seeing Greymin saying like, boys, I got this. And here comes the Protector. Here comes the Apocalypse. Nice combo. And it could be a kill against Muradin, but the Horrify from Gul'dan saves the day and not for Ragnaros. Oh, ooh, Aurel might have just saved Ragnaros' day. He's trying to get away. He actually is not trying to get away. <laughs> he just sat there after coming out of the egg and started to attack instead of trying to run away a little bit. So, yeah. With that, we're now having uh, the keep at the bottom of the map taken down. 14 stacks for Sylvanas is so far not really... I mean, I, I think Sylvanas needs to read that level 1 talent again, the talent description, if she wants to get value out of it. But they at least get value out of her disabling the structures and making wor short work of that. But yeah. <laughs> 11 minutes in and our Sledgehammer Muradin has not completed his baseline yet. Yeah, again. He has more, like, again, these Storm Bolts are limitless. These Storm Bolts are limitless. I, I, you don't have to go back to the Nexus and reforge them when you throw one out. You don't have to collect them after they are thrown away. This is not how this works. So he should be a little... Like, normally, I actually have to tell people to hold the cooldown back. Most people just spam all these things whenever they are ready. But not so him. He plays that a little bit differently. They're trying to get the kill against uh, the dog, and the self-ancestral is there. Good doggy, there we go. The amazing part is that Murden could even stack his Stormbolt against Misha. So he has not only five targets on the other side, he has actually six. And it is a problem, seriously. If you don't have the cooldown reduction and the pierce in these fights over the shrines, then yes, that is a problem. Especially when you're hoping to stack some damage from, well, heroes like Ragnaros on top of that, for example. So, well, right now the 16 talents are in. With this, we're getting, uh, first of all, the Earthgrass Totem, but now with Domination for the Snazzy Penguin, he can actually go for the one-shots. As I mentioned previously, if you, get do, if you get two wall stuns with that in a good position on the Shrine, you can do a whole lot of work with that. 11 kills against one, but keep in mind that the Pusher Laws won the first game. They won the first game, and, well, all that it takes in Division 7 is one team fight that you kind of ruined and the game might turn against you. So, with that said, five manning the bot lane right now, pushing that out a bit since there is obvious catapult pressure. Having the push towards the top now. And, well, with the camp that's coming and the additional talent that they have, they could go for the keep. And it seems that is what they're aiming to do. They're anchoring with Misha right now. Oh, it's a little bit of a cocktail play that we're having around uh, Greymane. Who sits at 26,000 damage, still only half the damage of Gul'dan, but as we said before, the effective damage and the quick kills that they're getting are absolutely worth it. So they're starting to jump in again. Three level advantage, Shrine is activating another 17, they're trying to poke a little bit, they don't find the opening though. 
And I guess they are just gonna move away and move on to the shrine instead, which is exactly what they should do. And the blue team obviously finds themselves in a spot where they have to say, okay, are we gonna do this? Are we actually gonna try and wait for level 16 and just defend, or are we just simply YOLOing into the shrine and hoping for the best here? And since this is Division 7, that's definitely gonna happen, and it's probably also the better choice. Murder missing the storm ball, jumping out, leaving Ragnaros alone. And the Horrify saves him for a second. Oriel helps him out for another moment, but that's the kill against Raggy. And now we're having another quick kill right there. Yeah, Muradin is nearly done with this with this quest. <laughs> 40 minutes into the game. And as they're abandoning the shrine, we have them, the red team, starting to take the control here. Yeah, it seems like we're gonna get a third game out of this one. Sylvanas has in the meantime gotten 18 stacks. <laughs> Uh, the quest on, on Ragnaros, by the way, in level 4 isn't completed yet either. So, with the Catching Fire, 12 regeneration globes, 14 minutes into the game. Not really an insane setup there. But yeah, this is definitely going to be another objective for the team in red. And 500 MS has so far controlled pretty much every single aspect of this game, if you're honest, for a moment. So, they're starting to move straight through the middle. Try and take that down, but well, that setup now for them works really, really well. I mentioned it previously, Ragnaros, probably not the best choice for this. Again, I mentioned this in the past, but like back in the days, one of the reasons why you would pick Ragnaros in a map like this is since his Molten Core can really get a lot of the value eliminated from objectives, you can delay the game, you can prolong it, and that helped to put other heroes, like for example Nazebo, into a better position since their whole value lies in the late game setup. Okay, nearly the kill, and Torrify comes out! Even the Apocalypse combo doesn't quite work, but Gul'dan still dies, and now it's time for Oriel to follow two down, and that should be the end of the keep, and if we're honest, with Mirrodin falling, it should be the end of the game too. And Mirrodin hasn't completed his baseline quest. With him running Sledgehammer! That is pretty, pretty terrible, to be honest. More Stormbolts, my friend, and especially in the early game, we saw so many Stormbolt opportunities that he didn't take. But right now, we're having a 1-1 situation. Any second, as 500 MS finishes the game and takes down the Pushaloas on the second map, Infernal Shrines. GG, and well played. Game number three, <laughs> the final map, everybody. The Pushalors with trouble in game number two have decided to go for a more aggressive strategy around Illidan, played by Cutter here in Cursed Hollow. We have Gorkhan of Fia, Coffin Girl, Falcon Tyrande, Bobby Ryan on Arthurs, back to the roots, baby. Sotillion on Johanna, very reminiscent, actually, on some of the heroes, at least, from game number one, where they took the victory. And now we have 500 MS on Dragvor with false stats, so going for the bird here. Amphethys on Anduin, Dark Cloud on Sylvanas, <laughs> Snazzy on Penguin, uh, no sorry, <laughs> Snazzy Penguin on Diablo, there we go, and Rexa played by another noob. Now the interesting part here is obviously going to be uh, Sylvanas, yeah we're going to see more stacks, talking stacks, look at that Illidan, the unending hatred, I mean he's experiencing a little bit of hatred after the second game I would assume. But still, I'm curious. I, I really want to see how this is going to end now. The first game was a fun one. The second one was a dominating performance from uh, 500 MS, I'd say. But I think that the blue team has a little bit more up their sleeve than we've just seen on the second map. That was not really a good one for them. Either way, it's the Illidan factor. And yeah, Illidan is currently sitting bot side against Failstep. So we'll see if he actually can succeed of getting a few decent stacks together in this game and then eventually has enough damage to chase teams. Now Illidan is a hero that usually excels in the late mid and late game because then the forts are down, the distance to safety is a lot higher and if Illidan excels at anything it is chasing teams chasing heroes once that a fight turns against them. So there is a little bit of CC obviously on the other team which is important to control Illidan but let's see how good Cutter is on this hero. And it's actually interesting to me that Illidan is not the one that is dealing with camps right now. 
he's still rushing around a bit, but normally I would have expected him to take over the top lane and then really take also the Siege Giant. It's not really the case. Instead, we're having, well, still a hero in every single lane, but it's a two-man setup that is going for the Siege Giants. And that's actually fair. Now, Falset is taking this too. Shouldn't take it yet, though. That's a little bit of a mistake from Drugboar, because as you can see on the minimap, this objective is spawning first at the top, so these Siege Giants get a lot of value around the first objective. So if you go for the Siege Giants this early, it means that the Siege Giants will arrive at the bot lane very early as well, and your opponent can take them down quickly. So normally, if you have the uh, Siege Giants on the side of the map where the objective doesn't spawn the first one, you want to delay it a little bit and take them later, and then you can focus the early efforts, for example, onto the camp right here but you kind of want to time this a little bit either one or the second so this is definitely something to watch out for a lot of the maps it's super important that in the early stages of the game you try and get those timings right and then you can set yourself ahead already pretty much quite a bit in the game itself one of the reasons why we're always saying about like watch the pros play and try to take something from that commentary usually includes at least some of these hints incorporate into your own play make sure that a shot caller is taking all these things into consideration and then if you play in an amateur league on a very low division you normally will be able to get a lot of value out of that because your opponent might not be aware of this and then they fall in the trap where you get a huge advantage and now here at the bottom of the map Illidan is currently trying to at least make the bird a bit angry with the camp now taken in the middle it's a bit of a better position that we're seeing for the blue team because the towers are going to help deep push all of this and then the camp is going to get value here the only question that comes with it is are you able to delay the top fight and that's what they're currently trying to do siege giants have been taken out and that's a problem Illidan needs to take care of it and Falset is already going straight into the middle first tower is down and down in... Ooh, Illidan actually going into the middle right now. The bird is flying into the top. Uh-oh. It's getting a slightly chaotic here. Again, you can give a curse up. You can, or a tribute. You can give a tribute up. Not doing that. Drugbo is low on mana. That's another problem for him, actually. So is another noob. Both of them should have maybe hit the Nexus before they're going into this fight. But now we're seeing uh, the bot lane get incredible value. The wall is open. They're going to get the second tower up to the top. The tribute gets channeled, too. And now you're looking at a setup where you ask yourself, why did Illidan no get back, not get back down to the bot lane? If you are in that situation in the first place, you can just rotate down, you can take the siege shines down and you give up the first tribute. You say, okay guys, they outmaneuvered us a little bit with the camps. Well, Illidan wasn't able to get enough just yet. Just move away and play around it later. But there wasn't a case here. So yeah. With that said, we're at least having Boomerang taken on level 7 now with this build and we're also seeing Updraft. Now, I have to stretch this again because every now and then I still see the talent taken. So, <laughs> everybody that watches the ARAMs that usually don't end up on YouTube knows exactly what's coming right now. So, secret weapon is shit. The talent is garbage. It is literal trash. So, even if you go into an auto attack build, never ever in your life take secret weapon it is total garbage you never want to take this talent it's all about boomerang now there are a couple of situations like 95 percent of the games that you play you will take boomerang there's a couple of games where you want to take boomerang and every now and then there's an outlier situation where boomerang is the better talent but outside of those you always go for boomerang so boomerang allows you to split push because of the wave clear boomerang allows you to uh, get also stacks for wingman faster boomerang allows you to get some burst damage in and it also helps you with not only damage output with getting some global value believe me secret weapon it's shit it's garbage it's a noob trap it's blizzard's iq test pretty much and if you take anything else but boomerang on level seven and you actually spec into a secret weapon then you failed that test so in a moment, I'm going to tell you how I really feel, but for now, that has to suffice. So the second tribute gets taken by the red team as well, so they're pretty heavily ahead now. Now level 10 is obviously going to put this into a little bit of a different dynamic. But with that said, we actually have Calderize Resistance on level 7. No Celestial Attunement, which is interesting. I would have expected them to go for the non-stun, but okay. If you want to go into the spell armor, that can be nice, but given the setup and the stuns that we see from Diablo and from Rexa, I kind of expected them to go straight into the Celestial Attunement regardless. Sylvanas, by the way, is stacking a lot better now. 
So uh, we're having at this point uh, 32 stacks for her. Still that weird level 7 talent for Bobby Ryan who didn't go into the Icebound Fortitude and instead goes for Rune Tap. Now I give him one thing, since this is pretty much low level play, one of the problems that you have in lower levels is that players just have a h tough time when they have an activatable to get value out of this. So if that is your reasoning why you don't go into Icebound Fortitude, then I might not like it, but then I can at least understand it. But generally speaking, Icebound Fortitude is the better talent. It's a little bit similar to uh, when you have players that are just total trash when it comes to cleanse. Yeah, we saw that. <laughs> uh, then sometimes you might not want to take it. Glow being used to come in. I was actually about to say that both of the teams are going for the boss, but that's not quite the case. Uh, one team goes for the boss. Ow Owl comes out, I like that. It's a good scout from Taranda. Gotta give a shout out there. Tribute has been taken by the blue team. They didn't have level 10, so they couldn't even fight there if they wanted to. But now we have it, uh, the level 10 abilities, and we actually get a little bit of global value from Illidan as he goes into the hunt. And again, Syndragosa! Again in Syndragosa at this point. So, yeah. So we have some global value to Illidan. Let's see how they're going to play this. Uh, currently we're having Ophia rushing away down at the bottom. And at the top, Arthas is the one that is dealing with the situation around the boss. That has been taken. But in terms of kills, we didn't find a single one yet. There is not a single kill in this game right now. Okay. So that boss doesn't really do too much just yet. Well, they get break through the wall here, but they are still slightly ahead in experience. Having Illidan down at the bottom of the map with 13 stacks on his level 1. And when it comes to the Unbound, we're actually having him now with currently 9 stacks here. Now again, you can stack obviously with Misha included as well. Which is going to be pretty important. This is an easy way for him to stack, seriously. Stacking around Misha, for example. In the meantime, we're having... Uh, well, Sylvana's getting saved here for just a second. Already uh, up to the bottom of the map. Yep, Kata moving back out. And he's sitting at 15 stacks now, so he's soon going to be completed with this. Another thing that you might not know is he can actually stack damage after the quest is completed. So it's not that it's just all done after that. You can stack more, but that's when the quest reward hits you. That gust was interesting, but I guess they're just trying to buy some time here. Now, with an owl, that could have been a problem, but as it stands, we're having the curse against the blue team. Still trying to fight here, but at this point, you could also just try and move away and see what you can get. Here comes Syndragosa and the Apocalypse. And that's a nice one, but that's not the only one. I think the jaws clasping on as they're trying to make the play for Diablo. Instead, they're settling for Misha, and Sylvanas is at the top lane and is doing split push things. Yeah. Animal Husbandry, by the way, for Rexa is starting to give him also a little bit of value. Again, there is no single hero that has died in this game yet. So Animal Husbandry on level 4 is these days not quite what you see most of the time, but in this case, it has worked out for them. So, currently looking at Rexa, we are actually seeing him with a bonus health of 850 which is not really too bad. So, yep, 850 for him right now. Just to give you guys a bit of an idea there. And with two forts eliminated, it seems like another one is going to be attacked now. So, they're moving straight into the middle at this point. Okay. That's a five-man setup that they have right here. And the blue team trying to defend, defend, defend. 110 minutes in and we haven't seen a single kill yet. What is this? Division 7? I don't know. All right, that might be Division 7. If you go for the boss right now, that could be an interesting fight for sure. The pings are there. Here comes Illidan. Yeah, you only lo YOLO once, baby. He comes in, tries for the YOLO. There's a little bit of damage, but Illidan is already incredibly low. That gust was also quite fantastic. Yes, the hunt into the back. And they get the kill against Sylvanas. Yes, they do. Illidan is jumping back in again. Coffin Girl is low and also falls after using the Shadow Walls here. And this seems another kill against the front line as Johanna dies. But Illidan a little bit too aggressive. Honestly, I feel in this case they could have really fought a nice fight, but Illidan for some reason felt the need to jump into four heroes and just said, let's YOLO this shit. Didn't quite work out. We'll have at least Sylvanas eliminated, but now it's 13 versus 13. That might be an issue. I'm not sure if they can really pull this off. This is something that I would be contesting. And yeah, they're realizing that they're missing quite a little bit on damage and they're already moving away from it. I don't really think that the blue team would have let that slide. Illidan is already sniffing around the edges and is saying like, ah, maybe we can do something here. 
Falstead, by the way, with a bit of a weird build, I gotta say. Giant Killer on level 4 is not... Uh, sorry, 13. is not really a strong talent unless you go into Seasoned Marksman on level 1 and spec into an auto attack build. So traditionally, if you're going for either a Wingman style or just in general this build, you want to have the cooldown reduction and the fast activation of your, uh, of your trade and make sure that you get value out of that and therefore more damage out of all of this. So yeah, not really the traditional talent to take. Don't really think it gives you a lot of value. Again, if you want to go in an order attack style, still take Boomerang on 7, but Giant Killer needs to be coupled off with the level 1 season marksman so that you get a bit more stacks out of that. With that being said though, we have now 13 versus 13. Illidan is dealing with the bottom lane and since he has his quest uh, completed, he also has the additional damage right now. Rexa still hasn't fallen, which means that uh, he is currently set up with a fair amount of damage actually. Uh, sorry, a fair amount of hit points. He's sitting at 4,400 hit points right now. And well, the boss is taken as they're letting this one slide. I like that choice. It's not a bad choice. The question is, can they maybe even go and contest the top? And I don't really think they're going to be fast enough with this. Because again, Sylvanas is obviously there. There's enough damage, so they're looking at an even exchange. But I like the way that Tyrande is at least scouting all of that out. It's a really small thing to say, and uh, some people are like, what are you talking about here? But we have so many Tyrandas, especially in the lower leagues, that just don't send these owls appropriately to the camps to try and sniff out the opponent's position that it's kind of nice to see that the Sylvanas, uh, sorry, Toronto player is actually doing that right now. So yeah, that's an important one. The problem that comes with a bit of this setup is that they now have level 16 against them, but Falstad has shown on the bottom of the map, which means it's a 5 versus 4 at the top lane. So if Illidan is able to jump into here on the back line, they might actually be able to get a quick kill here. So there is a chance that they can take this fight. It's a little bit of a bad move by the red team, honestly. If they plan to go for the keep, they should bring all five and just let the fort at the bot lane fall. It's a great trade for them regardless, but they are risking a lot here. They might win this, but it's a big risk to take and they could be destroyed. Five versus four, even with the talent advantage, it's risky. And yep, they're about to lose Anduin here. Anduin should fall and he goes down. They lose the keep anyways, but the fight... Actually, they should have just chased this. So that's a little bit of a mess up by the, by the blue team now too. So both teams with mistakes. The blue team could have wiped this. Illidan chases you down hard in a situation like that. So there is a really good chance, or that exists at least, for the push allures to kill more than only one hero. And they're trying to go in again. Illidan is way too deep and is falling immediately, overextending heavily. But they could have forced that fight at the top a little bit more. Now it's a 4 versus 4. The keep at the top lane is down, but the blue team could have gotten a good trade-off here, which they didn't. So they're still trying to get at least Misha eliminated, and that works, which should give them the tribute, actually. That has a little bit of an interrupt attempt, but doesn't connect with everybody. And Taranda is channeling it through. So yeah, that worked out. Did Forza just fly here? That didn't happen, right? No. No, 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 no. That didn't happen. All right. Did he just fly there? Nah, there's no way. Okay, so two kills against three. And at the bot lane, we're having a Siege Giants taken again. But coming back to the decision. After you already realize you're going to lose the keep, you could have taken down your opponent's team here easily. Now, Falstead shouldn't have gone for the defense at the bottom of the map. In this case, it more or less worked out for them. They got the keep, they lost the hero, but they saved the fort at the bottom of the map. But if you go up against a team that is a little bit better, they are going to absolutely punish you for the fact that Falstead isn't there. So in this case, it works out. That doesn't make it a good play. Again, it was too risky and it could have been punished for it. This again is a big fight and Arthas is down nearly immediately. Not having the army of the dead is proving quite difficult for him here. They're also having nearly a kill against Illidan again. They interrupt against Anduin's Uldus too though. That's at least something. So Tillian trying to turn this around, but Johanna is about to fall. And that's five kills against two now with another tribute now spawning. And nobody dying on the other side here. Yeah, the value of the Apocalypse definitely coming into play for them. And with Illidan sitting tight, we have him currently on 20, on 52 damage actually. So yeah, 52 attack damage for him. But bot lane gets pressured again, and with only three heroes, that hunt is a little bit ambitious. Gets some damage out of it, but can't really chase too hard here, or he's gonna be taken down too. False that is flying in, but they're actually getting a Diablo kill! There are only three though, and these trades, well, if they can get the bird now, that might still be worth it. They get still a two for two. 
Well, two for one even, but Illidan is now dead as well, and that's just problematic. Ophia is down too, and now you have to deal with his entire push still, so you end up in a pretty bad trade regardless, because you overextend a bit too much and don't wait for the rest of the team. The keep is taking damage, they might get the counter kill and they do against Sylvanas, but they still have to deal with the Siege Giants in particular. That's currently what they're attempting to do here. Two tributes against two. We have 19 and a half, so nearly level 20 for 500 ms. The push and loss, on the other hand, still an opportunity. Interestingly enough, Illidan has not completed his level 4 quest yet. He's three stacks short from doing getting that done. In terms of damage, Ophia is sitting at 77,000. But yeah. Having a little bit more setup, it can actually be nice if you have just that coordination. But that's the next setup that we're having right here. In the meantime, when we're looking also at our builds, we have the Blades of Azanoth now in. And with a 5 versus 5, and most of the cooldowns just about to be coming back. We have a little bit more there. Oh my god, crippling hammer. Again, guys, 13, 16, you want to have the cooldown reduction and the fast activation so that you get more value out of your uh, out of your spells. That's a normal build to go for here. So, yeah, not really what you want to do here. Now, that was a nice setup. Starting to stun. They're trying to set up more. Unfortunately, our fear doesn't quite get the value here. So that's a lot of uh, abilities used for little value. And here comes the apocalypse setup as they're trying to go for the kill. They're going for Jojo. No level 20 for the blue team, but they are still doing fine and they're about to get a kill and now it's Illidan's time to hunt. He needs to be the one chasing them down here. And for some reason, he is the one channeling. So this is really a problem. Honestly, this is a problem. Illidan YOLOs in into three fights now and has died in those fights nearly instantly. And when they finally get kills, he doesn't chase. Illidan needs to chase. If you have an Illidan in your setup, you want to chase. You want to make sure that you have an opportunity to hunt your team down and do that quickly. They go for the boss, which generally speaking, I don't mind, curse or no curse. I mind that they actually split this. Why? What is the value of getting this camp now? It's zero. If you get the boss already, that camp doesn't do jack shit for you. So you're actually splitting your entire presence on the map, and for what? That camp doesn't do anything here for you. Five man the boss and then take another boss at the other side of the map or push or move down, take the, the fort in the middle, move a little bit farther down. But yeah, splitting the hero, you just waste the time. So if you find yourself in a situation like this, make decisive decisions and make a choice and just go for that. Arthur's pushing with this. Again, the question is why? What does Arthur's do here? If you're looking at the experience, that's fine. Do you need that experience? No, you're level 20. Arthur, having Arthur's here is just an invitation to kill him. So he doesn't need to be there. That fort is dead anyways. You have a boss and siege giants in this case. So they didn't get anything out of the curse. They just got, well, they get two bosses out of the curse, but they could have gotten so much more. They should have killed every single fort here at least. That's the big one. So again, in this case, obviously we're gonna rip a little bit in the decision making, but this is an opportunity for everybody on the lower league to learn a little bit what they do. Taking a boss during a curse is not a problem. There's a lot of like Wood League players out there that have just graduated from Plastic League that will tell you, you can never do that. It's obviously a dumb thing to say. But you should still try and get value. Get a boss, move into the middle, take the fort there, move to the bottom, take the next boss there. Always keep in mind where your opponent is. They will have to defend. You will probably see them on the map. Don't get, don't get actually like captured anywhere. It's important for you. So now as we're having a cap in the middle at least, there's the push at the bottom of the map and well, there we go. There's an opportunity with level 20 talents now. Illidan has opted into uh, Nexus Blades. Here's the absolute zero as they're trying to go in. And the kill against Misha. And Misha kills are important. You oftentimes glance over them, but it's important to take that down quickly. That was a nice setup here against Diablo and he gets stunned again. Oh, that's the mighty gust being used and they can just rotate away from this now. But again, keep Illidans on the sidelines a little bit. Try and get value from the heroic, uh, sorry, from the global now. Make sure that he doesn't fall into a trap. Keep an eye on where your opponent is on the map. Minimap is your friend. And yeah, then you have to try and coordinate the fights a little bit. But as I said previously, the team in blue could be farther ahead if they would have just used Illidan's advantage a little bit more. Now looking at the deaths that we have in the game, Rexa has died once, so he got obviously reset. He's currently sitting at, uh, well, two, uh, at 6,300 hit points, which is a lot, honestly. Actually, I think Rexa hasn't died yet. I think it was only Misha that has fallen. And yeah, Diablo has still the higher hit point pool. 
but still. So there's the tribute, and this is a cursed tribute for the red team. So the blue team is kind of forced to fight over this, whereas the red team has the option to let it go. Also talking about let things go, that bottom keep is getting attacked. Fight at the top lane right now is the main focus from the, this entire setup on the other hand. And let's see how that's going to work out for the two. So already the damage in the back. Ult comes in from Ophia again. They could focus on Misha. Oh, wind tunnel. Apocalypse connects still with two. And a kill against Ophia. And with the Hellgate, they get a second one against Johanna. And again, Johanna again with the radiating faith. Question why? Illidan down, well, Falsehood has fallen, but now with the curse reached and then chasing down the rest of the team, this could very well be the end of that. Absolute zero! Saving at least to run the... I'm not so sure about Arthur's yet. Especially since we're having, yeah, everybody else jumping after him, and that should be game. No hesitation for 500 MS as they are starting to go for the core and for Taranda. That's going to be a five-man team wipe as they are about to end the game going straight for it not bad losing game number one starting the comeback on infernal shrines and making it a 2-1 victory with 13 kills to 9 on cursed hollow gg and well played as 500 ms takes the victory against the pushalors in this division 7 best of 3 series